I'm Sergeant Alfred Brenner. I came to this school and graduated this school in 2007. I graduated here in June, obviously, and then two months later, I went straight into the Marine Corps. So I went to Marine Corps boot camp in August, was there for three months. It's the longest of all the training and all the services. Um, and from that point on, I graduated and went right to military police school, which I was a military police. And then from there, I was selected to become a canine handler, which I was trained to find explosives and handle a bite dog. Um, so we went to school there, learned all the training, and then we went to Camp Pendleton, California, where I was paired up with this guy, Grief. Can you guys see that right? You see him? Yeah, black dog. Uh, this dog was actually bought and trained in Germany, and then we brought him back over to the States where he was paired up with a handler, which was me. I had him for about four months. He never listened to me once, didn't want to do anything I said, and it wasn't until I deployed where I realized that he was trained in German commands and he didn't know English. So, fun little fact, um, which I, I learned after trying to teach him German, he knew right away. Good dog, right? Uh, so this is me and Grief at the training facility in Yuma, Arizona. We go to this right before deployment to get them acclimated to the weather, the terrain, because uh, obviously everything over in Afghanistan is all desert terrain, not like sunny California. Um, so we had to get them acclimated to the weather and the terrain, get them used to different exposures to different buildings, um, things of that nature. So we were there for about three months um, before we wound up going into training. Uh, again, this is just us goofing off. Um, not that important. You can see he's not happy about it. Uh, does anybody know what this is? What does it look like? I'll, I'll let you off the hook. What does it look like? Plane inside of a cargo plane. Now we're inside of the cargo plane flying into Afghanistan. Flight to Germany is like 16 hours. Then from there we went to Longstuhl. Then from there we went to Afghanistan. So a long trip. They had 33 dogs on one plane. Yes, it smelled and it was loud. Oh, it was disgusting. So 33 dogs on one plane, 33 handlers, all deploying the largest deployment of dogs since Vietnam, which again was not fun. Now when we got there, they didn't have much uh, to sleep with. It was just a dirt area there. We wound up having to make our own bed. We put in tents, floors, AC. Uh, we had you know just cots set up everywhere. So this is where our kennels was at and we actually stayed here for about two weeks before we were sent out to another place and that is actually where we worked out of um, when we were attached to other units. Does anybody know what this is? Wild guess. Throw it out. Bathroom. bathroom. Who said that? All right, I'll get you $100 later. So the bathroom, uh, again, there's just basic combinations. You got your sink, your water, you can you see now. And then you got uh, just your shower stalls. This is if you were lucky. Most of the time, it was a bucket that they had um, in the middle of the field. But TMI, and you guys just ate lunch, so. Um, this is actually where we slept. This is uh, the basic accommodations for what we had. It was just a tent, basic floor, and then you had all your stuff. This is everything that I carried throughout the entire deployment. So if I moved from place to place, I had a kennel crate, the dog food, you see that little container over there, all of our bags, everything you needed to survive throughout the entire deployment, which was six months. This gives you an idea of kind of what happens. I know it's not like much, there's not much I can show you. You guys can Google images. Um, I had some things, a lot of the stuff we did was classified because we were looking for ordinances. Um, but essentially it was this. It was, you know, hanging out, sleeping. If you weren't sleeping, you were walking around. You see Grief down there, he's got some booties on. And that's because it was 126 degrees, which was the hottest it was. So that means the ground was like 135-ish. So he needed to wear those booties, those rubber booties on his feet to make sure he was protected. Um, again, more in detail about just the day-to-day -day life. A lot of walking around, a lot of searching. There was just open areas, buildings, um, dirt. You guys have seen a lot of the war movies that recently came out, you know, like Lone Survivor, American Sniper, all that type of stuff. They do a pretty good job depicting it. But... That's all the fun and action stuff. Most of the time, we just kind of walked around, talked to locals. There's a lot of peacekeeping efforts, uh, made sure that you know we had what they needed and we protected them. This picture is of me and grief on um, the side of the road in October. Uh, in October of that year, 2010, I was sent to work with the Army unit. Uh, the Army unit there was doing this big clearing operation where they needed a bunch of extra help, so they took a couple Marine, door, Marine Corps dog handlers to go work with them. So this was in between a three or four day mission. I slept there for about three days on the side of the road. So this is all we had. This is everything we had. 
that, you know, grief was obviously more than comfortable. You know, dogs don't need much. They just need some water and some love. I mean, you guys know that, right? Who's a dog person? Okay, who's a cat person? <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand for the cat? No? Okay, a lot of dog people. I like it. Um, so this is exactly what we had. This is basically our basic load when we went out all the time. This is what we needed to bring. Kind of guys can see it in real life here. Not all the stuff, obviously, but you guys need an idea. Um, so in October, during this mission, we went out for the last time. It was supposed to be seven days, seven days long. Uh, we get to an area where it's very similar to this, actually. It's an open area, had a building here, and then down this was a long road. So like, so the hallway, this is 400, right? Yeah, so like, like the 400s you and know, all the way to the gym. And by the gym was a bomb that they found in the middle of the road. So instead of going up and playing with it like they did in Hurt Locker, they actually blew it up from a safe distance. You know? So they would go and they set up an explosive and they would do a controlled detonation where they would blow it up. So we're sitting there hanging out and then you know, they're down there playing around getting all the bombs set up. And I'm sitting here on the wall. And this kid, Steven, that I was with, was sitting right next to me, like right here. And he's playing with grief. And he's like, oh, I got a dog just like this at home. And I said, eh, OK, you know, we're just small talking. He's having a good time. Then they get on the radio and say, hey, we're about to blow up the bomb that's over there by the gym, right? So we have to get back to a safer distance. So I go to stand up. And as I took a step to the left, all of a sudden, a big bomb went off, real loud. And all I felt was this big cloud of smoke Things hit me in the back of the head, and I turn around in my retractable leash. And if you know what that is, it's just a really long leash that moves in and out of that little thing. So went all the way out into the smoke, and my dog is just lost. And I started pulling him. I started calling for him. I was like, grief, come, come on. And I was pulling it, and he's just locked up like a scared cat, just like this. And as I get up to him, I check him to make sure he's OK, that everything's all right. He's fine, just a little shell shock. And then right next to him is this big crater in the ground. And inside that crater is this kid wailing his arms and screaming and yelling. And then just like choking, I mean, if someone's screaming, you know he's what? Breathing, right? OK, so he's breathing, so he's OK. And he's wailing his arms and legs, so I know he has arms and legs, right? So a couple bumps and bruises. He's in the middle of this hole. He's probably all right. So I go and post security to make sure that they get him out of there OK. And as they go to call it in, I got to go search the area for the helicopter to come back. So I'm kicking rocks, searching with grief. He's like, I'm out of it. I'm done. But we're both walking, making sure if anything's on the ground, we'll set it off. I don't want the helicopter to. So as they call in the helicopter, I hear them say that somebody was killed. I said, well, who was killed? That kid was fine. He was laying on his arms. But I obviously didn't pay attention to science, because obviously when something blows up, it goes out, not in, right? So Steven, that I was sitting right next to, was on top of a pressure plate. IED, and when he got off, it set off the IED, and he was killed instantly. So that really set the tone for the rest of the day. I was so upset. I mean, I just talked to this kid. He was just telling me about his dog and what he's going to do back home when he gets home in North Carolina. And it just really set the mood for just a horrible day. As we start to take off from that area two hours later, they find another IED. And this is the day-to-day -day operations. Every day, there was one after another. Someone gets hurt, you have to pick yourself back up and go do it again. So they find another one. So we're saying, look, we're going to sit in this building for the night, basically lay down, wait until everything cools over to the next day. So we get up to this building, again, very similar to this. It's about 11 feet high, 12 feet high, all mud, big, thick mud walls. You guys probably have seen pictures of it. And there was this big door, and it was locked. And the captain I was with wanted to break into this building to go inside and basically sleep for the night. So he hands me his rifle, and he starts to peel away the mud of this door, and he starts to yank on it a little bit to break it down. And as he's doing that, this sergeant major we were with, I was with all the higher ups, and we're doing our thing, and he's there. So he wants to jump over the wall and go search the building by himself. So he hands me his rifle. He hops over this wall, and he's running around inside. This guy's yanking on the wall, about to pull it down. I'm just. Like something bad's about to happen. Like this is not does not look good. As he's about to rip the door down, the A and A we we're with gets so upset he yanks the door down. They start screaming, nah, 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 nah. and they're like, "Well, what's the matter?" And they said, "Take a picture of the door. Like you guys are breaking stuff. You need evidence. You have to justify it." So we're like, "Okay." So I go and I take out my camera. I go to take a picture of the door. Took a picture of the door. 
turn around, and then right after we get the door down, the guy who hopped the wall comes out the front door, and he's coming back towards me. So I go to walk toward him to give him his rifle, and I just go one, two, and then right before I took my third step, an IED went off on me. So it was waist high in a wall, and it blew up. Now, I'm standing there, right next to the wall, get blown up. I feel like I'm flying through the air, flipping and flipping and flipping. Finally hit the ground. I, you, don't, you don't see anything. Actually, if I was to stare right at this light and close my eyes, you know when you do that in the sun in the summertime? That's exactly what it was like. Just staring into nothing but bright light. And then all of a sudden, the ringing in my ears stopped, and I started to hear people talking. Like, oh, go get him. Who, who's hurt? Who's this? That? They come up. They start grabbing my arms. start grabbing my legs. So I feel them moving my legs, so I know I have them. I know I have arms. So I'm thinking to myself, God, now that I'm not going to die, because I knew right away I thought I was dead. Now that I'm like feeling like I'm okay, I knew right away my wife was going to kill me because I just told her I was going to be fine. And I'm laying there on the ground. They call in the nine line, which is an evacuation report. They call in to get the helicopter in, just like the other time. And I heard them say, one wounded and one KIA. And then I'm just laying there thinking, oh, shoot, someone died. Like, it had to have been the guy ripping the door down, right? This guy's crazy. He's ripping the door down. He's right there. But they called it in for my dog, who was standing right next to me on the wall. And he was killed instantly. So they called in a helicopter, and they got us both out of there. And from that point on, it was just endless amounts of surgery, therapy, rehab, the nine, you name it. Like you guys break an ankle before, stub the toe, you know how much things hurt and how long it takes you to get back to normal, right? Um, so this is a pretty good picture of kind of the injuries that I had there. Um, most of the time, it's just my arms and legs. You guys already ate, which is good, because before the other class was like, oh. This is not too bad. A lot of guys had it much worse. Um, I had a guy, my, one of my roommates in the hospital, he was a MARSOC captain, which was a Special Operations Command captain. He lost both of his legs. And he said, I can't wait to get back out there, bro. You coming? And I was like, out where? Outside? Like, what are you talking about? He meant Afghanistan. He wanted to go back. That's how some of these guys are. They just are built for this. They, they would live, breathe, and die for one another, and they want to go back. To be honest with you guys, I want to be honest. Christian school, I want to be very honest with you. I was done. I wanted to go back home. I feel like I did everything I needed to do. I just barely made it, and I was very, very blessed and fortunate to be in this position where I can at least talk to you guys, and I feel like it was worth it more for me to come out and kind of tell you guys how this all was um, as opposed to me kind of coming back. And to be honest, I just wasn't built for it, okay? Um, it's just... It is hard. It's tough. And some of these guys do it three, four, five times away from families. Um, and that's honestly what really, really, you know, hits home on Veterans Day for me is that, like, people say thank you. I'll be honest. I did a little bit of stuff. I wasn't, you know, out there. You guys seen stuff like Lone Survivor and stuff? Those guys are crazy. And, you know, Marcus Luttrell, he went back again. Yeah, that's bad. So these guys would live, breathe, and die for this. I got, um, when I was in the hospital, the very first time I ever, ever shed a tear about anything. You know, you're numb. You're not know, the medicine, the injuries, all this stuff. You're numb. But I saw this picture pop up with like, all these hashtags, like never forget, grief, best dog ever, amazing, all this stuff. So I see it and uh, immediately started crying my eyes out. I didn't even have to read all the comments. I just started crying because it was the first time I realized that this guy who was with me every day and saved my life and saved the lives of people behind me is now gone. You know, and he didn't have a choice in the matter. And that really just hit me, and the emotion of grief actually fell over me so heavy. And it was the first time I actually went through the process of grief. Um, so interesting enough, you know, his name was Grief, which still boggles my mind. Um, this is not a picture of grief. This is a picture of uh, Diesel, who is my service dog, German Shepherd. Uh, I got, after I got out of the military, again, it was kind of like an impromptu decision. I was like, look, I want another dog. Got Diesel, trained him to be my service dog. Uh, I took him out a lot, helped me out with PTSD, TBI, the whole nine for the first couple months or a year. And then I just took him out for demos and stuff. I hate taking him out. He's annoying. He smells. He's hairy. He's a dog. You know, he gets my car all hairy. I, I didn't want to bring him today just because he's distracting. You'd literally be staring at him the whole time. You'd be like, I didn't even know where he said. 
No. So this is Diesel. This is us at the uh, Memorial Day Parade in Brooklyn two years ago. We got to go up there. Uh, it was a great time. So I've, I've been very blessed to be able to go out there and do these types of things, um, to be able to just kind of be a representation of what some of the other guys could not represent when they didn't come back. So um, I just really am so thankful to even be here to talk to you guys. The, the fun part is actually going to be coming up. So if you're still awake, we'll wake them up with the lights there. And uh, go into some Q&A. Before you guys sit there and stare at me thinking of your questions, I have a question for you guys. I'm trying to figure out, this is going to be kind of tough. Is anybody here thinking about doing the military despite the talk I just gave? <laughs> <laughs> that crazy? A little bit? Thinking about it? All right, what grade are you in? I'm a junior. Junior? Nice. All right. Anybody else? What's your name? John. John? Anybody else aside from John? Thinking about it? You know? You, you had your last class too, right? Yeah, you've been here, so you haven't seen it. So, John, why don't you stand up for me, please? Do you mind volunteering for a second? All right, come on up, John. I, we just got a volunteer, guys. Come on, we just got a clap. <laughs> John, John! <laughs> all right, John. You're going to help me out, all right? So, obviously, every one of these kids can't come up here and touch it and put it on. Um, so you're going to have to do me a favor. You're going to have to put this on. He put it on correct. Do you know the last class we had someone put it on backwards? <laughs> yeah, it was funny. He was a good kid. Um, put this on. So basically what John's doing is he's going to give everybody here an opportunity to see how horrible it is to put this on, how heavy it is. This is probably half the weight of what we carried over there. Obviously, I didn't bring in any ammunition today, so that's a lot. You know, six magazines full of bullets, that's heavy. Um, you have the helmet. You got to complete the look, man. And then uh, you got the bag, which is full of stuff. You know, your clothes, you know, anything that you're going to have to bring with you for three to four days at a time. That's the big pack. Most of the time, I just have a small pack. But this is for like three-day mission, which is full. How's it feel? Uh, it's all right. Yeah? <laughs> it's, a, it's just, it's not bad, right? I want to go for a run now. You know? Oh, you do? You do? No. no. <laughs> I was like, we can make it happen. Yeah, buckle it up. Are you good? All right. Hey, give, it a, give a round of applause for Johnny here. Thanks. All right. Take a seat. With? Yeah, yeah, with it on, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll be serious. Keep the head on, too. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can't keep it. You're just going to borrow it. I'm not going to go back to the seat. No, you sit in a different seat. Don't sit. Sit, sit behind the... Uh, sit there. See if you can fit. <laughs> we had to sit like that. As if we had to go to an airport, we're ready to go somewhere, like get on a helicopter, you sit like that for three hours waiting. It's so annoying. And like, again, you guys see him later in gym class or yoga or whatever you're doing nowadays, go ask him, you know, how was that? It looked like it stunk. And he's going to say, yeah, I'm not joining anymore. That was horrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so definitely talk to him about that. Uh, we'll spend... What time is it here? We got... Got a good 15 minutes. Oh, 15? That's good. Okay. So about 15 minutes of staring at each other, waiting for questions. So who wants to be the first one? Extra credit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like half a final grade, by the way. Disclosure. I'll go again. Yep. Are you going to ask me to take it off? No. Oh. <laughs> well, what would you have to say to like me if I wanted to go into it? What would I have to say? Like advice and stuff? Yeah. Um, sounds crazy, and I... I, I've done a lot. I've actually, I was in the Marine Corps, but I was working with a lot of different services. I worked with the Army. I went to an Air Force Department school, which is the DOD uh, dog school. Joined the Air Force, hands down, no questions asked. I mean, I, I did the Marine Corps, to be honest with you, crazy story. Recruiting office had like seven different services, and I walked in the door, and the guy was like, hey. And I was like, yes. And he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't, I don't know, I'm just like going to join stuff. And he's like, well, come here. And he talked to me. It was the Marine Corps guys right in the front. You know, the Marines are always in the front, you know, front of the line. The Navy was floating off in the back somewhere. But the guy was like, what are you doing? And I joined the Marine Corps. It was the first door on the left. That's what I did. But then I go through the services, and I realized the Air Force, they eat good. They sleep good. They're all about technical stuff, so they may, you can't get promoted unless you go to college. Like my job, if you say, oh, I'm going to do school, he goes, I don't care. Go out and shoot stuff. Like bottom line, that's it. So I didn't know what I was doing. I don't regret a moment of it. Like I love the Marine Corps. Obviously, it's the best of the services. We have a high standard. But if I were to do it over from an educational standpoint and life goals and all that other stuff, Air Force is good. But all of them across the board are good. Just make sure you pick a technical job. Because if you go in and your job is to kill people for a living as a grunt, and you get out and you want to get a job somewhere and your resume says, I killed people for four years, 
you know, not much you can do except become a hitman. So just think about like <laughs> technically, you know, technical jobs. So um, I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Um, so you like trained like other people like after you got back. Like, mm -hmm. what did you teach them that like you wish you knew like when you were there? That's an amazing question. I'm glad you asked that because I don't ever get credit for this. Um, so <laughs> I went there. Um, I think it would be all right. So I get so worst day in my life was uh, we had a bomb go off. A, a, a big vehicle came over a hill, hit by this giant IED. The the vehicle got exploded. The driver was killed instantly. Unfortunately, he was kind of all over. Um, I had to search up to the vehicle to clear an area. Um, so I, unfortunately, there was body parts and other things all over the area. Um, I didn't realize it at first, but my dog was freaking out because there's explosive odor everywhere. And there's all these other things. So I'm thinking to myself, this is so distracting. Like, you can't train for that. You can't train, let's blow up something and then go walk through an explosion and have body parts everywhere. You can't train for it. So I freaked me out. I was stressed. My dog was stressed. So when I came back, I trained with the guys. I had an ID problem. Normally, they just go down, find it. Oh, good job. I put a big hole in the ground. And then I made fake body parts everywhere. So I took basically like lunch meat and spaghettis and meat sauce and tomato sauce and I sprinkled it all over the place, all this random food and stuff. So when then the dogs came down, they were distracted because they said, why is this big hole here? And their dog was freaking out looking all over the place and he missed the explosives. Same thing that would happen to me. Obviously that's as close as we can get. So I did things like that, outside the box thinking that would scare them, get their heart rate up and then change the dog's behavior because you can't train for things like that. So that's the type of stuff like I experienced firsthand that we didn't do before I left. Great question. Yes, sir. What does an IED look like? Uh, I, I was going to show you guys pictures of it, but then I thought, let's not, like I'm not going to bring pictures of bombs in the schools and stuff with everything going on. You guys can Google it. You guys probably Googled worse. So check them out. But um, a lot of them were pressure plates, like I said Stephen was on. Okay, science class, metal, metal, a wire. So in order to complete the circuit, the metal has to touch each other. And then when it does, it sends a current to the bomb, goes boom. That's a lot of what they did. You can buy this stuff at Home Depot and make your own bomb. Didn't tell you to do that. I'm just saying that's what they did. They got this stuff on the internet and stuff, and they all homemade explosives. So they put the explosives in a jug, and then a lot of them were just these pressure plates. Because if we were walking, we'd hit them. If a tire hit it, they'd hit them. And then some of them were remote controlled. They used remotes like this which basically had a signal to that, that was wired to something and it went off. But the explosives themselves, you guys can Google. Good question. Anyone else? Um, are you still in contact with anybody you're in service with? Yes, yeah, I, uh, we were deployed with a lot of them. I'd say more than half I stay in great contact with. Sometimes we visit them, we meet up at events. That one right there, we had four other dog handlers come out. Um, one of them is a famous dog. Have you guys seen on the news that dog that has three legs? Luca? Do you hear about that dog with the leg? It's got like 50 million views or something. She was a dog that deployed with us. I trained the handler that deployed the second time, the first handler, the one you guys see in the news. He was a kennel master and a very good friend of mine when I was hurt. So he was blown up. So we still see a lot of them. Do you guys see the movie Megan Levy? No? Yeah. So we'll still see it. That movie's about a girl that was at our kennels. She was at our kennels that time. So um, it's good stuff. Anybody else? If that experience didn't happen to you, where would you be today? If it did not happen to me, I'd probably still be in the military. If it did not happen, my goal, I told everybody when I got back, um, I would go to the uh, dog training school. I wanted to go train the dogs in Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. So I wanted to go do that and then probably stay in as long as I could. It's just smart. 20 years in, you get out, you know, you're 40, you're retired, you can start a new job, a lot of life experience and goals. That's what I wanted to do, but guess what? God has different plans. You guys are going to wake up tomorrow and, I don't know, you might be in Mondon, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. They don't even call it Mondon anymore, right? It's Donovan. Donovan. <laughs> when you were hurt, did you like realize anything big, like that you wanted to achieve, or like? Do? No, absolutely not. I had no idea. Like my again, my life was turned upside down. Um, I didn't know what I was capable of doing. So the first goal was to just get better health, like health-wise. I couldn't walk initially. Like it was just really hard. Um, so I got better health-wise. I can drive and talk on the phone. That's basically all I can do and talk to you guys. This is the limit of my capabilities. Um, so I had to figure out what I wanted to do. Initially, I had a job training service dogs. I liked it a little bit. I hate dealing with dogs because then everybody Googles my name and says, can you train my dog? No, I'm not going to train your dog. It's like your problem. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, that's when I started to realize I became a real estate agent. It's really funny, right? It's like random. But 
I'm really good at it because you can just be professional, you drive and talk on the phone, and that's what I do, and then this is what I love to do. So I do that for work, and I do this for fun. And to be here to see you guys, I love seeing you guys. Good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, did your experience here at St. Rose prepare you for anything in the military um, that maybe your other, you know, your fellow soldiers like didn't have the, the benefit of? I'd say the biggest thing. I think I was already like this, but again, mostly because of my upbringing. Catholic school my whole life. I went there from 1 to 12. A lot of it was discipline. The, the order, discipline, uniforms, obviously. I had that my whole life. It's the exact same thing the military is. This is essentially like the military, just less running. Um, <laughs> unless you have Mr. Devaney for gym, then he just screams for no reason, right? Uh, so, yeah, essentially that's all it was. So that did prepare me a lot. Some kids were in there. They get out of high school. They dropped out of high school. They didn't even have GEDs. You know, some of them were about to go to jail. And the judge goes, you want to go to jail or the Marine Corps? The guy goes, well, that's a no-brainer. So we got people like that in there. So it's a mixed group, but it definitely prepared me that way. Yeah, one over here, right? Um, like, how long did it take you to be, like, mentally okay and, like, talk about it? Good question. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, but I am not okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, it took, it took a while. It took a while. I talked about it. It was a homecoming party. They had about 600 people come down to my hometown, Jackson. Big parade. A lot of people came out. There was people outside of the place in the street. I actually told my entire story two or three months after it happened. So I could talk about it. It's not an issue. Again, that has to do with your upbringing, your morals. Like I have a different outlook on it. A lot of people can't bring it up. But it gets better over time. The first time I told it, I'm like getting choked up. The thing that kills me is every time I see that picture of grief that when I showed you guys, I almost always get like a little choked up about it because I do miss them. You know what I mean? That never goes away. Time heals those things, but it never lets them go away. So, but it took. So it takes different for each person. You know, it always depends. We got a couple minutes. I re I remember when these classes end. I've been here in a while. How much? Twenty three. So you got that. Uh, I thought so. It was twenty three. We got seven minutes. Three minutes. Yes, sir. What happened to your arm? So this was an open fracture. So when I was blown up, I was walking this way. This is the bomb. It blew off part of my arm, so they had to repair it. They took a big chunk out of this arm, and they put it here, like real Humpty Dumpty stuff, uh, to save it. Fused veins, arteries, muscles, and everything to make sure that I can still use my hand. So that's like the function. I had fractures in this hand, so this hand's like stuck like this. And this one actually, so four, I'm missing one. Because what happens is I put my hand up to hand him his rifle back. It just blew my arm apart. And I have this here. Um, skin graft, and I had that taken from my leg, and it was just little injuries here. I had a nurse come in, took the sheets off, she goes, oh, you have legs. I'm like, I, I think so. You know, it's a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys were just, you know, when they walk, the pressure plates are on the bottom, blows their legs off. I was very fortunate. Mine was in the waist, waist high in a wall, so I was very fortunate that it just affected me that way, so it could have been a lot worse. You still have a lot of medical issues that you still have to deal with? Um, I think limitations is where I'm at now. Issues, it was before where it was like a lot of things that hurt a lot, a lot of pain. This finger was stuck like this, so I couldn't use it. Uh, these hands, this finger was like stuck, so it was a lot of rehab, so initially stuff. But now it's like limitations. Like I hit plateaus. Now I can't do certain things like, first of all, take that off before you pass out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to, yeah. I do that all the time. I ranted the other class. The kid was like this, falling over in the seat. You did good though, John. Um, but yeah, now it's just a lot of limitations. I got to the point where I know what I could lift and move and pick up, so I'm pretty good now for the most part. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Wasn't bad? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, poor guy, yeah. Everyone who walks around with their hair like crazy today, you can be like, hey, you got him. You got him. Yeah, oh, it's every day. St. Rose memory. Oh, good question. <laughs> who's, who, whose teacher is this? Who, who's she's it? Not mine. <laughs> Are you supposed to be here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. She's got oh, 10 gold stars. Um, oh, God. Oh, I don't know. It's been a, a good one. Um, Favorite Sarah. Sarah's, Sarah's memory. I, I, good one. I mean, we had a lot. Good, this guy here, Anthony Renato, do you guys know who he is? He's a little bit, professional baseball player. He scored a thousand points one day. We, me and my buddies had this plan. There was this van on the side of the road. It was like white, white, white van, like creeper van. 200 bucks. It was like not working, but we wanted to buy it and put it out front of the school, paint it with like all these colors, and then blow it up 
like when he got a thousand points. Like this is how our minds think. We're like, oh, I'm gonna blow up the van. It's so cool. Like a thousand points, and then so he he, he hit the thousand points. No van was involved, obviously, but we went nuts. We jumped out of the stands, like hitting each other. Stopped the game. It was crazy. So that was a good one because I felt really happy for him. He hit his thousand points. I have a lot of others, but that's probably the cleanest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, the blown up van is the cleanest story I have, I know. And that was before the military. I didn't even know the military exists like before that. Like I that was bad. Yeah, so I think we're good, right? What do you got? Yeah. No, two or three minutes? Well. Yeah. I, w I wanna thank you so much, uh, Sergeant Brenner and, and students for your great questions and uh, as we said earlier in the in the uh, presentation, you know, pray for the veterans uh, um, I have a my youngest son. Uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He uh, was an Apache helicopter pilot. Now he's riding a desk in the Pentagon, and uh, I think he preferred the other, certainly. But um, and uh, I think it's just a time to appreciate appreciate military families, appreciate uh, what wives go through, uh, the importance of their faith uh, in getting through uh, the deployments, and. Uh, it's just uh, something that unless, I guess unless you experienced it or today had a chance to get some of that experience and to get to feel uh, what it's like and to recognize that Al uh, may not say it and doesn't want to really acknowledge it always but is a, a true American hero. And he sat where you're sitting, he did the things that you do Maybe some things we, you know. <laughs> uh, and I'm kidding. But, uh, and then made uh, a sacrifice um, to protect and preserve the things that we take for granted every day. Just our ability to go about our day, to, to live freely, to worship freely, to do the things that sometimes we take for granted. So we get a chance this weekend, pray for and thank a veteran. Okay, thanks for your attention.